And I believe his subject this afternoon will be socialism in the world today. So Vijay, thank you and you have the floor, comrade. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be with you and I'm sorry about the mishap earlier, but you know, um, things happen. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually talking to you from Santiago in Chile, where um, it's part of, as is sometimes called um, a new pink tide. My sense is that, and I want to start here um, before we move on to perhaps the most important and, and, and um, uh, significant issues, which is to try to analyze what is socialism today. I want to start here because there have been a range of uh, center left and left governments that have emerged, whether it's Colombia, which is soon going to inaugurate for the first left-wing government since that country attained its independence in 1810, uh, the government of Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez, both uh, with deep roots in the left movement in that country, both people who ran with a left agenda um, in a coalition that included various popular movements, including uh, the former FARC, now known as Comuna, and the Communist Party and others. Um, what is happening in such a significant part of the world, in the American hemisphere, just before um, the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, which we shall commemorate next year? What's happening? You know, what's happening in Mexico when one sees Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador um, of the Morena Party take such a firm position against the imposition of US imperialism regarding particularly Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela? What's going on here? What's going to happen when Lula most likely will win the election in Brazil in either early October in the first round or in late October in the second round? What's going on? <laughs> um, it's significant to ask that question. Well, first, as I said, let's start here and then let's talk about what is socialism and what is socialism today. Let's start here. What's happening? This is the fourth wave of left center left movements um, in Latin America. So what do I mean by fourth wave? Well, look, everything before 1959, before the Cuban revolution, can't really be considered part of a broad wave of revolutionary movements in the sense of a socialist revolutionary movement. There were bourgeois revolutionary movements, Bolivarianism, for instance, uh, had a very strong class character. Uh, it had its limitations. It was, of course, an immense advance over European colonialism in the hemisphere. But before 1959, there were various attempts, you know, social democratic type attempts in individual countries, such as in Guatemala under Jacob Arbenz and so on. But, but the Cuban revolution really turns the tide. Um, it sets in motion new social forces in the area, um, a greater confidence and clarity about the possibility of socialism in the Americas. After the Cuban revolution, as I said, there were four waves of struggle. Um, the first wave attempted to replicate the Cuban revolution in other countries, including Che Guevara's uh, attempt to overthrow the government in Bolivia, where he lost his life. He was killed in 1967. Um, that was the first wave. The first wave was crushed not only by um, the hemming in of Cuba itself, uh, you know, with great force and violence by the United States attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro, attempt uh, an invasion on Cuba at Bay of Pigs, 1961, and so on. Not only that, but also eventually through Operation Condor, which installed military dictatorships initially before Condor, 1964 in Brazil, all the way out to 1976 in Argentina. A series of military dictatorships installed by the United States in Latin America, cut down wave number one. Wave number two begins with the Nicaraguan revolution, the Grenada revolution. This is a wave that is more located in the Caribbean and in Central America, again, disrupted by US military interventions. The dirty wars, uh, you know, um, ground zero being Honduras, from where the United States prosecuted dirty wars in El Salvador, Nicaragua, entering into Grenada to overthrow the Grenadian revolution and so on. That was the second wave, vicious entry by US military forces into the Caribbean 
the greater Caribbean region uh, to hold off the second wave. Didn't succeed in holding off the Nicaraguan revolution, but bear in mind that it was the liberal Jimmy Carter who authorized the mining of Managua Harbor uh, to start a blockade against the uh, Nicaraguan revolution, 1979. That was the second wave. The third wave, perhaps the most promising wave, uh, was begun and re re largely won through the ballot box opening in Venezuela in um, 1998 with the election of Hugo Chavez and his broad spectrum movement. Um, that wave was occasioned and, and advanced through high commodity prices, um, through the United States being distracted by events in the Middle East and so on. And eventually you saw that wave uh, pierced through um, a social democratic barrier because these governments understood that um, they could use high commodity prices, the royalties from those commodity prices to drive a social welfare agenda, but not country by country, but regionally. I think the great advance of the breakthrough in 1998 was the idea of Bolivarianism uh, to create a kind of continental system of regional trade using regional forms of currency payments in cross-border trade and so on. Um, but at the same time, to utilize these developments, not to advance the cause of national bourgeoisies, uh, but to uh, drive a socialist program inside these countries. What I consider to be significant about the Cuban dimension of this particularly third wave was that it took the two concepts of the Cuban revolution and brought them into South America and other parts of Latin America. And that's number one, sovereignty, fighting for the sovereignty of your country, of your region as well, not just your country. And the second principle con concept is dignity, fighting for the dignity of your people, eradicating hunger, eradicating homelessness, eradicating the uh, you know people not having medical care, eradicating illiteracy and so on. Uh, the twin concepts of sovereignty and dignity, which is really an advance that uh, Cuban Marxism uh, provides for these revolutionary waves, that was significant for wave number three. Wave number three was disrupted by the hybrid war pushed by the United States government, particularly against Venezuela, by the collapse of oil prices, um, by you know really interesting forms of political interference in, in Brazil, what we call lawfare, but also in other countries. Look at the situation that was met um, by developments in, um, in, in Cuba, where after a brief opening during Obama, um, Trump comes in and, and tries to throttle the Cuban revolution with 243 new measures. Uh, this was part of the attempt to derail the third wave of revolutionary developments in Latin America, the fourth wave, uh, which we're seeing now comes at a time of depressed commodity prices, comes at a time when the United States is being extraordinarily aggressive in Latin America, particularly because it fears the entry of China. I'm going to return to that later. Um, and because uh, these bourgeoisies are now simply not challenged sufficiently by social and political movements in their own country. So we are seeing objectively that this fourth wave is more a social democratic wave than a socialist wave. Um, it's keener in a sense in protecting the sovereignty of, of these countries, um, making alliances with the national bourgeoisie, not so keen on driving an agenda of dignity uh, within the country. Hunger eradication, for instance, not high on the agenda in Chile, for instance, or in uh, what I would imagine will be the agenda in Colombia, certainly not there in Argentina, where the government was quite pleased um, with great internal dissent to go to the IMF um, and cut a deal with the IMF, which increases austerity. Okay, so why I wanted to start here, not only to locate what I'm thinking about from this location, but also to talk a little bit about the fact that socialism isn't something that you take from your head into the world. Uh, Marx and Engels write in, um, the German ideology that socialism is, or communism actually is, is the word they use. This is in 1846. They say communism is the real movement of history. That's an interesting phrase. Um, that's a really interesting phrase. That's a phrase that immunizes us against utopianism, 
voluntary thinking and so on that really infects uh, anarchist movements and others where there's a view that you know if, if perfection is not before us then everything else is is a failure um, no we have to look at the real currents of history the real objective uh, possibilities uh, where for instance a vanguard party can insert itself to drive an agenda forward um, there's no point trying to drive an agenda forward in a sectarian way have to drive an agenda forward alongside motions of history that could be accelerated uh, but can't be invented out of whole cloth and i think that's the understanding the left movement has in latin america now the point is to look constantly for opportunities to strengthen the left bloc to drive and accelerate a left agenda but yet to recognize that with low commodity prices with a very aggressive united states knocking at the door and so on where you know it's not that these are fabricated problems there was a coup d'etat in 2009 in honduras against the government of zelaya again not a left government but a center left formation um, and then there was a, a coup d'etat against the government of Evo Morales in Bolivia. Again, uh, a government for 14 years that had improved the conditions of people's lives, that had tried to drive the agenda of sovereignty and dignity, overthrown by a US instructed coup in 2019, just yesterday, as it were. So for this current period, it's not like the aggressiveness of the United States has diminished into some sort of liberalism, not on display. Um, so that's how I wanted to begin. Socialism is the real movement of history. Um, I think it's incumbent on people who are socialists, who are in a communist movement trying to drive a socialist yeah. agenda, to be quite aware of this, to be quite aware of the fact that, um, you know, one cannot fantasize about, um, you know, just installing socialism, but always looking for opportunities, uh, looking to see where spontaneous developments break out amongst the working class, the peasantry and other important allied classes. When spontaneous, um, you know, developments take place, how does a class project get um, driven into it? This is actually very important. And I want to pause here to, to make a cautionary note about the absence of working class organizations of genuinely serious Marxist organizations. The two examples to look at immediately are Egypt in 2011 and Sri Lanka right now. In Egypt in 2011, it was a mass uprising. The left was superbly weak in the uh, Tahrir Square uprising that took place. Um, the only major organized force apart from the um, established forces, which are the bourgeoisie and the military, the only force that was capable of challenging them was not a left organization, but the Muslim Brotherhood. And in fact, it took the reins of the uprising in Tahrir Square in 2011. And then the principal clash became between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military, and the military prevailed. Um, General Abdul Fattah el Sisi then became President Sisi. The absence of a class project um, available to give direction, to give form and force uh, to a spontaneous uprising, the casualty was the people there. Um, that's a, a really important lesson to take from Egypt, but it's not a lesson that we always take. Look at Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, mass demonstrations. Now, there's some question about the character of these demonstrations. Set that aside for now. Nonetheless, mass demonstrations against the Rajapaksha uh, grip on power in Sri Lanka, um, the two brothers in charge of the country on behalf of the Sri Lankan ruling class. Two brothers run out of office in Sri Lanka this last month, just like um, Hosni Mubarak was run out of office in Egypt. Um, Mahinda Rajapaksha runs off to a naval base and his brother Gogama Rajapaksha goes off to, um, to Singapore. Well, what, does, what happens? Where's the left force to give direction? Where is the Marxist class project to give direction to this uprising? Uh, not available. And therefore, because of the weakness of the left in that sense, um, the uh, Sri Lankan bourgeoisie turns to an old war horse, Ranil Vikramasinghe, and asks him essentially to take over the country. Mr. Vikramasinghe's party only has one member of parliament, uh, that's himself. And he was basically backed by the Rajapaksha parliamentarians to bring him into office. He continues the state of emergency, promises to bring US imperialism into Sri Lanka and so on. 
Sri Lankan ruling class pretty happy, sends in the military to smash the protesters. The US ambassador goes to shake his hand in a photo opportunity, puts the picture up on Twitter. Um, the absence of a working class Marxist political project is, on a, is not available there when spontaneous uprisings take place. You know, we are in a time now when more and more spontaneous uprisings are going to take place. The example of Latin America on the one side and of Egypt, Sri Lanka on the other, uh, remind us of the absolute importance both of being uh, quite clear-sighted, clear-sighted about the exact situation in the world that we live in. In other words, you can't accelerate um, in a voluntaristic way. Uh, you have to be precise, you have to observe uh, the conjuncture, you have to observe the real movement of history. On the other side, you can't just you know, um, liquidate the left project because if you liquidate the left project, when the spontaneous movement of history takes place, when people rise up against um, the, the, the crippling um, austerity conditions put in place by the International Monetary Fund, both in Egypt and in Sri Lanka, when the people rise up, in the real movement of history, the class project is simply not available. So when we think about socialism today, the task of the socialist to, is to build that class project and strengthen, build, strengthen working class power, clarity, confidence, and so on. Um, the, you know, when people say, well, you know, this movement is basically anachronistic, it's had its day and so on. We, one doesn't listen to them. Don't engage with that argument. Um, we have to keep our eyes firmly on the task at hand, uh, which is building class power, building the vanguard organization in order to constantly accompany the motion of popular uh, development, popular movements and so on until there's that spontaneous breakthrough where we need to insert ourselves, insert the clarity of our theory, insert the clarity of our discipline, um, insert the fact that we are needed to shape uh, the movements as they develop. It's very really interesting, after Tahrir, I, I had gone to report in Egypt on the uprisings and I'd encountered a lot of reporters. One of them was a reporter from the Boston Globe, very nice man, um, you know, very decent liberal gentleman. Um, he, after the Tahrir debacle, wrote a book called Once Upon a Revolution, which is a very good book. Unfortunately, of course, you know, he opens the book by attacking the Russian Revolution for, for no reason, but actually for a reason. He says that, look, the problem with the Russian Revolution was that there was this centralized party that came in and charged. The good thing about Egypt was there was no force like that. But then he says, well, but sadly, because there was no force like that, you ended up with utter uh, chaos and the military reasserts itself. And there's a point in the narrative, which is a very nice narrative, of the revolution, where he says that, look, at this point, the somebody should have gone and seized Maspero, which is the building which houses communications, um, you know, uh, radio, television, and so on. Somebody should have gone and seized Maspero. But who? Who is the somebody? Where's the class project, you know, with the theory of revolution, um, disciplined people who are going to go and do that? Uh, who? I mean, you know, he says somebody as if you conjure it out of thin air, but that's the work of building the Marxist class project, building the disciplined cadre, building people with a theory, with the capacity to understand what to do in a revolutionary situation, not to go too far ahead of people. In other words, accompanying people in their struggles, but at the same time, when the spontaneous uprising of people occurs to act decisively, uh, not to dither, but to act decisively at that point, seize the means of information, um, provide leadership to the movement and so on. Uh, that's precisely what one joins a communist formation for, um, accompanying people in a time when there's the building of a revolutionary wave, but at the moment of the spontaneous rising, asserting yourself and your theory and your discipline and your class project uh, to the front. Uh, uh, it might have to contest other class projects as well, but precisely if there is no working class project contesting for leadership, then that is basically an empty space. And then forces like the Muslim Brotherhood assert themselves or the military returns as in Egypt or in Sri Lanka, the ruling class simply sends in their old war horse in the name of Ranil Vikramasinghe. 
So what is the situation of socialism today? Socialism basically is in a long trough of building up power, uh, but at the same time, and here's the second point, and I'll, I'll close with this point, but at the same time, while we are building up project, building power in our different locations, looking for the opportunities to assert ourselves, we have to, uh, you know, be honest and, and say, look, but there are already older socialist projects which have maintained state power. Um, and we have to think about what should be the relationship of the forces of, of left political, um, you know, organizing vis-a-vis -vis these particular projects. And I, of course, mean Cuba, um, you know, China, these two are the principal ones, but also places where socialist formations are in power, even though it's not a socialist country. Like Venezuela, for instance, is an example. Kerala, the state of Kerala in India, um, and so on. These are places where the left is in a position of power, but the state is not itself a socialist state, unlike in Cuba or in, in China. That's a distinction I would make. What should be the relationship of left forces with these projects? Well, certainly one of solidarity. Um, this is a complicated word, and if you'd like, we can talk about that. One doesn't have to agree with everything that a socialist state project is doing. Um, in fact, one mustn't agree with everything because after all, uh, you know, ruthless criticism is Marx's is, 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 um, is statement. One doesn't have to agree with everything. But on the other hand, we have to remember a formula given to us by Fidel Castro. Castro, when he was talking to intellectuals after the Bay of Pigs, made a very important intervention. He said to the intellectuals, look, we're not trying to stifle your criticism. You can criticize things, but you have to make a distinction between criticizing inside the revolution and criticizing from outside. Are you trying to make the revolution better or are you trying to overthrow the revolution? Now, I fear that in the West, comrades, um, a lot of criticism of Cuba and of China has moved into the camp of trying to overthrow these uh, projects, particularly now when we see formations of the left cavalier about um, the attacks on Cuba in particular country of only 11 million people uh, unwilling to defend the Cuban revolution, being seduced by the social media campaigns around July 11th of last year and so on. Um, I find this to be very disturbing. Uh, the Cuban uh, you know, state project, socialist project says openly, you can give us constructive criticism and so on, but it's different criticizing within the revolution and trying to overthrow the revolution. And many people in the name of the left in the Western countries have moved into this camp of counter-revolution. One has to be very aware of that. Um, and, and of course, with China, now that there is an accelerated, um, very dangerous situation between the United States and China, Nancy Pelosi entering Taiwan, God knows what's going to happen. One fears for the planet in this confrontation, egged on, uh, not really only by Washington, because even in Washington, there are contradictions, um, but egged on by sections in the United States ruling class, very dangerous confrontations set up against China. Um, at this time, how does one relate to China? You know, how does one relate? Well, there are sections again of the metropolitan left that have picked up on things like the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, picked up on Hong Kong and so on, um, not to say, how do we improve the Chinese revolution, but to overthrow uh, the Chinese revolution, a revolution with a, with a communist party of 95 million members. You can't defeat Iraq, you can't defeat Afghanistan. It's a hallucination to believe the United States will be able to defeat China without bringing the world to Armageddon or at least to the edge of Armageddon. So a lot of the left has allowed itself to be weaponized into this, this you know fanciful attack on social media against anti-imperialists as it were. We are proud to be anti-imperialists, don't have any problem there. Um, we are proud to be anti-imperialists. At the same time, we are proud to say that we are critical of any project in the world, including the socialist state project, although we criticize them from within the revolution. I think that's the distinction um, that I want to make. So what's the state of socialism today? It's a very broad topic you've given me. I wanted to suggest um, in summary that, um, First, in terms of our movements, our socialist movements around the world, we must understand the absolute importance of our projects to build and accompany people's movements, uh, and also to build the discipline, 
the strength, the confidence of our own cadre uh, who understand that we have to constantly improve our theory to be prepared for the moment when we have to act to assert ourselves um, in struggles. Uh, we must not feel like we have to be behind where the people are. We have to be with the people, but at times we have to push uh, the struggles forward, put the left project on the table. Um, at the same time, as I said, the second uh, problem for us is how to affiliate, associate, to relate to um, socialist state projects. And I gave some suggestions that I think we have to defend these projects. But at the same time, I think it's perfectly acceptable to offer criticism as long as it's criticism within the revolution. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and then uh, see if we have any discussion, if that's probably, I think that's probably the best. Okay, thank you very much, Vijay. Um, I'm sure comrades have questions, so please raise your hand. Um, thank you so much for everything you said. Um, I have a question as, you know, uh, a new communist as like a growing communist who maybe isn't educated on all aspects of uh, the movement yet. Um, how do you act as a someone who's criticizing from within the movement when um, <clears throat> in conversation with people who are only interested in asking those questions about uh, the most controversial aspects of actually existing socialist or uh, governments that have socialism in power. Should we go one question at a time and just answer that? How, how would you like this? Sure. Yeah, one at a time. Okay. That's a really good question. And let me tell you firstly, and quite honestly, there is no easy answer to that question. Um, you know, I, I I won't say that I spend a lot of time on social media, but I do get into some, you know, I guess brawls, or at least people attack me a lot, particularly on China. Uh, why? You see, there is a, 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 maybe it's a sentiment that wants to say, oh, you're not, if you don't attack the Chinese government on Xinjiang, and on what's happening with the Uyghurs, then everything you say is irrelevant. I mean, there's a that's a kind of posture that's put to people on the left. And it boxes people in and you feel sort of disarmed. What does one to say? Um, you don't maybe don't know enough about what's happening in Xinjiang or about the Uyghurs. And you know, you don't have enough confidence to say much. And but of course, you know that on the say at the same time. Uh, about a million people were killed by the United States in Iraq. And the person challenging you on this has said nothing about US imperialism. And the actual wars uh, against places like Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. Well, if you start raising those issues, they say, well, now you are a whataboutist. Very interesting phrase, whataboutism. Whataboutism comes from Ireland, or rather the British occupation of Ireland. Um, in the 1970s, I believe, or maybe the, yeah, in the 70s or early 80s, um, the Irish Republican Army began to attack civilian targets in London, making the claim that, you know, uh, the British colonial forces in um, the north of Ireland had been attacking civilians. Now, when challenged, the IRA responded, you know, they were bombing pubs and so on. They responded saying, well, you know, you've been attacking civilian targets in the north of Ireland, so we are bringing the war to you in London. Well, in the British newspaper, the phrase whataboutism came, saying that, well, these people from, from the Irish Republican side who are defending the attacks in London, they are whataboutists. They don't want to deal with the fact of the attacks on the pubs. They keep saying, well, what about the attacks over there? Now, it turns out that this Phrase is a form of information warfare that comes from British intelligence, but let that be for, for a moment. Um, well, if you start saying, well, what about Iraq? You know, what about Yemen? Let's talk about that. Why do you keep raising the question of Xinjiang where a million people have not been killed? You know, we know that a million people were killed in Iraq. You're unwilling to deal with that, but you keep wanting to talk about Xinjiang. Well, one has to have a great deal of fortitude to talk to these people, especially online, because there's a lot of information warfare 
that takes place. And I, I don't want to come off as a kind of paranoid nutcase, but let me tell you that every generation learns afterwards about the kind of projects that intelligence has wielded in the previous generation, okay? I wrote a book about that, Washington Bullets. You can go and read it, the CIA documents about how they disarmed the left on this issue or that issue. In fact, I found in the CIA archives a text about how uh, a gentleman in Taiwan was saying, we should use the Muslims inside China as a weapon against the Chinese communist project. Quite interesting, that's from the 1950s. So one of the things is it's quite okay to say, look, we don't know what's going on there or that you know, there's somebody in China saying X, Y, Z, let's go and find out. Or maybe the party wants to hold a study group where you engage people in China and try to learn what's happening. Um, you know, I, I've tried to do that myself. I'm not an expert on Xinjiang, never been there. I've been to China several times, but never been to the Western provinces. What, from what I've learned talking to people in the universities in Western China and so on, um, is that, look, frankly, until the uh, arrival of Xi Jinping in 2013 to leadership in China, the Western provinces, including Tibet, were quite largely ignored. Uh, by the uh, developments taking place on the, the rim of China, on, on the South China Sea, so that most of the development taking place in China was happening there, um, but very little was happening in the Western states. After the financial crisis in particular, 2007, 2008, the Chinese party started to think about, well, how do we create an internal market if we're not going to rely on the United States and Europe and so on? And so abolition of poverty was one part of the Chinese project. Got to abolish poverty, use sort of social transfer payments to raise standards of living so that you can create an internal market. And that brought in the question of the West of China and of minorities in China. China has a serious problem of social hierarchy uh, between the people you know, of a certain ethnicity and then minorities and so on. It's a serious problem. In fact, Mao Zedong tried to first engage that problem in the 1950s in the National Minority Commission. In this last decade, in fact, it's taken the Chinese revolution a very long time to face up to the problems of the minorities, the Miao peoples and so on. When they went to abolish the last 100 million people who were struggling with absolute poverty, most of them were among the minorities. Well, that's when the question of Xinjiang comes in and the Uyghur population and bringing the Uyghur population into education and so on. At the same time, it turned out that in Xinjiang, there was radicalization. Xinjiang borders Afghanistan, borders um, Central Asia and so on. A lot of the kind of radicalized currents, um, you know, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and so on had begun to influence uh, disaffected young people in Urumqi and other big cities in, in, in Xinjiang province. In fact, I met some of these fellows on the border between Turkey and Syria. They are hardcore jihadis fighting against the government in Syria. Um, now the headquarters of their movement, the East Turkmenistan movement actually is not in, in, in Xinjiang. It's not even in Central Asia. It's now in Idlib in Syria. That's where their base is. Um, so they faced that problem and the Chinese government was trying to deal with all these problems. And what they didn't do, they didn't do what the Russians did twice in Chechnya, was basically invade Chechnya and use armed force to destroy all the cities. That's not what they did not do. Uh, what they did do is to bring in some of the radicalized people into re-education camps. Now, let me put something to you. Um, can we have a serious discussion of what to do with people who are joining terrorist organizations? You know, what does one do in a society? Um, you know, do you kill them all? That's the preferred United States solution. That's what the Russians under Yeltsin did. Um, and Putin, the first time he became president in Chechnya, is that the solution? But that's not what the Chinese did. Can we have an adult discussion about it? Apparently not. Apparently, those who are so against the Chinese revolution aren't prepared to have an adult discussion about this. They would want to say rather that those who want to have an adult discussion are genocide deniers. So there's no discussion then. That's what Fidel meant. Can we have a conversation inside the revolution versus outside? They want you to say, we condemn the Chinese revolution. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. 
But I want to have an adult discussion about what's happening in, in Urumqi, in Xinjiang province in, in general. Well, they don't want to have that. They want to just name call that. Is it genocide? Is it not genocide? Even in, in Iraq, I've never used the word genocide, but the United States killed over a million people in Iraq. Um, you know, but we are not using the word genocide to describe it. I'd like to have an adult conversation about the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq. So that, my friend, is how I would approach these answers. You know, if people are interested in having a serious adult conversation, let's go. If you're just going to name call, then where's the room to have a conversation? Hi, uh, uh, my name's Spencer. Uh, your talk on uh, these like revolutionary, like spontaneous moments uh, really resonated with me because I got my start with uh, like organizing at, uh, with the 2020 uprisings in uh, America. And looking back on it, it seemed like, you know, there was so much stuff going on. It seemed like a, a perfect storm almost. You had uh, people who were kind of rediscovering class consciousness with the uh, COVID pandemic. You had people out in the streets, uh, like actually fighting the police a lot. And you had uh, a lot of people uh, in cities all across across America, either burning down police stations or even out West, uh, a very short lived, like uh, people taking and, uh, and holding territory away from the police. So I guess my question to you is looking at the 2020 uh, situation, do you think like, would you consider that a potential like missed like revolutionary moment that like could have been taken advantage of if there's a strong enough left at the time? You're talking about, I, I think, I'm guessing, you're talking about the Black Lives Matter wave of protests. Um, yes. Yeah, so Spencer, that's a different issue, actually. Um, in the United States, I would say that punctually, you know, I, I've forgotten the statistic, but I think one point something people are killed by the police every day. Um, I've forgotten the exact number, but anyway, punctually in the United States, there are demonstrations against um, racist police action. Uh, but initially, particularly against African Americans from the late 19th century, um, you know, the movement uh, against lynching, for instance, is a movement against, which is saying essentially Black Lives Matter, um, right um, up to the present. There's repeated and punctual uprisings against the form of a racist state, which operates against certain people, uh, black and brown people with extreme violence. Um, that's not exactly the same as a revolutionary situation in the United States. So I'd like to say two things. One is, yes, I feel, I, I'm just speaking on a personal basis. I felt that there was the absence of a left project inside Black Lives Matter. Um, I felt that too quickly it was allowed, it was uncontestedly allowed to go get absorbed in a kind of bourgeois liberalism, you know, which includes the kind of mainstream Democratic Party. Um, you know, let's elect a Democrat and it's all going to end. This is a, a constant theme uh, of absorption of, of, of energy that comes from below. Uh, energy then dragged into the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Um, I think that's, again, as punctual as these uprisings is this drawing away of the energy. So there was no, it seems to me at least, uh, from a limited vantage point, that there was no left project regarding Black Lives Matter. And that needs to be constructed. You've got to go back and read, um, you know, earlier figures in the United States, um, you know, who wrote about, uh, you know, what would be a left project regarding, um, you know, policing in the United States. How do you contest the racist state structure um, in a way that then makes alliances with trade union movements and others? It's a, it's a fact that, you know, when Black Lives Matter protests happen, why doesn't the trade union, why don't the trade unions come onto the street in large numbers? You know, why don't they blow the whistle and say, we're going to send, you know, 5,000 Teamsters into the protests? Um, you know, why don't they join um, directly as a Black Lives Matter plus workers protest and so on? We saw that in India during the farmer struggle. When the farmers went out on a big strike for a whole year, trade unions came and joined them explicitly, not like trade union is coming to join the protest, but the unions blew the whistle and sent people. Um, women's movement came out again. The leaderships blew the whistle and people came out. It's different from individual members coming or locals joining. Um, I'm talking about the full heft of the movement sending. So there needs to be a lot of building with other formations in a country like the United States 
to build the class project you know i mean it it's a question worth asking what is the what is the project the left project in the united states today what's the class project you know um what is the what are the sets of various um you know uh, approaches to different fragments of uprising like black lives matter like perhaps the wave now of 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 unionization at places like Starbucks and Amazon and Trader Joe's and so on, you know, places where the liberal bourgeoisie shops actually, that's interesting, Trader Joe's, Starbucks and so on. Um, what's the class project there? Is there a way we can envisage what's happening beyond the, um, the local victories at this or that Amazon, you know, shipping plant or at a Starbucks and so on? What's the class project? It's not clear to me what that is. And I might not be looking at the right thing. So as I said, from my vantage point. So yeah, at something like a wave, punctual repeated wave of protests like Black Lives Matter, I think there needs to be a real sense of how to push other formations in the United States to take a, a position on these kind of demonstrations. You know, how a class project can give leadership to it. Uh, so that it doesn't quickly and vacuously get sucked into mainstream democratic party or into NGOism. Uh, how do you enter that space to ensure that that energy isn't diverted, which is what happens? Spencer, I'm not answering your question. I'm just sort of putting forward a kind of, uh, you know, um, a grammar, as it were, for you to think about how to answer the question. Yeah, we have like four people here at least. Okay, we'll take one question online and then we'll continue with the questions from the audience. Uh, oh, there's two, I guess. Oh, okay. Uh, should I just say we're taking a question from the Zoom? Sorry, we're taking a question from the Zoom. Do we? This is a question from Vivian, uh, Vivan. Uh, it says, you know, there's something of an obsession amongst the Western anarchist organizing block with activating, reclaiming, and centering the lumpen proletariat, which goes hand in hand with social organizations supplanting principled class struggle, we say without discounting their relevance. I'm curious about an example like Petro and Martez. Could you talk a little bit about how they have avoided this infiltration, especially with a criminal class who are strongly guided by the far right? And perhaps is there a reflective moment wherein we can avoid sectarianism to our anarchist comrades in the US, taking the example of Colombia's resistance to infiltration from liberalism slash NGOism, not to deify Petro? That's a great question. Um, that's a really, really thoughtful question. It's going to be hard to answer it just in a few minutes. But here's, here's what I would say firstly. Firstly, if the issue is anarchism specifically, um, Colombia doesn't actually have a very big tradition of anarchism. Uh, fortunately for the left of that country, as a consequence of that criminal ruling class and the brutality it's inflicted on the population, um, most of the left forces have really quite matured in time into mass struggles, into understanding the capacity and importance of the mass line. Um, and I think that's really what saves um, the block that Petro and Marquez have led is that most of the, all of the constituents actually of the left and most of the major constituents of the left participated in the electoral block um, have some adherence to the mass line um, because they also came out, if not of much earlier politics from the 1950s and 60s, such as 
of FARC and the Communist Party and others, but even more recent politics, the last 15 years, like Congreso de Pueblos and so on, um, they all have an understanding of the mass line, which was accelerated by the 2019-2020 protest cycles um, in Colombia. Cycles of protests against austerity, but also for the um, Havana peace agreement made between the guerrillas and the state um, for the implementation of that. So the mass line is at the center of their political practice and thinking. That differentiates the situation in a place like Colombia from many of the um, countries of the West, the United States, Canada, uh, parts of Western Europe and so on, where most many left currents don't have an adherence to the mass line. Um, and in fact, there's a, I, I mean, I'm going to use pretty strong language in this. Um, there's a way in which anarchism hasn't matured uh, into the mass line where there's quite happy tendency to have small groups um, to um, be to object to any state project, to object to any straight project on the grounds that taking power itself is, is an error. Um, you know, it's easy to say we don't want to take power if you're not struggling with hunger. Uh, a country where there's mass hunger the people who are hungry want to take state power. They want to change the direction of, of, um, of who controls the state, what should be uh, the use of the social surplus and so on. Uh, but if you don't suffer from the indignities of everyday life, it's easy to say, oh, we are suspicious of taking state power. Um, all of these are a form of, in my opinion, and I'm again using strong language, form of political immaturity. Um, where people say, well, I, I don't care about, you know, the mass line. We, we don't have a mass line. We have the correct line. And therefore, only eight people adhere to that correct line. That's a classic form of sectarianism. Um, of course, many of these people are very noisy on social media and so on. And they appear to, they, they in a way, pretend with a few hundred following and so on to have a kind of mass um, you know, they speak for the masses, by the way, this is, they claim to represent the masses in an unaccountable way. They're not accountable to the mass line. Um, I would say, go back comrades and study the importance of the mass line, uh, the importance of rooting uh, your revolutionary work in the struggles of the masses, as I said, accompanying the masses and so on. Um, in the West, there is an affliction of this. This problem has been there for a long time. There's an affliction of this because it's easy to, uh, you know, take a strong position of purity, um, partly because the people who have taken those position of purity uh, don't suffer the indignity of everyday life. And I think that's that's something to, to think about. Go back and read Lenin on imperialism, where he argues that there are, you know, the advantages of imperialism in the, in the metropolitan countries. Those advantages, those social advantages have an impact on on thinking. Um, it is interesting that anarchism has no social base in the poorer countries of the world. Uh, anarchists need to reflect on that. You know, why is there no major anarchist movement in the poorer countries? But again, it's a really good question and, I, and I'm only starting to answer it. Any more from Zoom, but can we take three more questions here? Uh, Hi, um, my name is Khadija. Um, I just wanted to, um, I also want to make a comment on anarchism. Like, you know, anarchism is never really vilified, especially in the US, but communism um, always is, um, which is interesting. And um, I just wanted to ask like, like in the 2020, like what um, Comrade Spencer was saying when, um, those spontaneous Black Lives movements were happening. Um, they weren't, I felt like, you know, more so on the left, we didn't utilize that kind of um, revolutionary momentum to really push for something. It's always like, well, the masses aren't ready, the masses, but the masses are showing us that they are ready for militant leadership. And I felt like we we kind of really missed, um, missed the ball there. Um, um, also, um, I was thinking, how do you kind of meld um, trying to appeal to 
the masses, trying to appeal to the workers, but also holding a strong theoretical line. It seems that a lot of times when you want to appeal so much to um, the workers who do not have a real sense sometimes of political maturity, you sacrifice your theoretical um, base and understanding and just get swept into this kind of too much an, of an emphasis on um, electoralism and it, it veers into a kind of liberal um, territory. So my question is, how do you keep that from happening? How do you keep a strong theoretical base and at the same time appeal to the masses and not be set, sucked into this kind of liberalism um, under the guise of um, wanting to appeal to the masses? Yeah, I don't want to come back to Black Lives Matter and whether there was, um, you know, sufficient or insufficient revolutionary intervention there. And I'll, I'll leave that for a second. I want to come to a little bit to our tradition of Marxist theory. Um, what you've raised in the this question you've asked is actually a dazzling hundred-year-old debate. Um, we we actually struggle with this in in the in the continent of Marxism, as it were. This is a big struggle. Lenin, um, you know, in the late 19th century, criticized the populists, um, the Narodniks, for instance, in, in Russia, people who would go to the countryside and do whatever the people told them. By the way, this is a, what the Narodniks did is a direct line to a very famous US organizer, Saul Alinsky, uh, who basically argued similarly that you go among the people that was community organizing. Whatever the people tell you, you should do. He has been criticized because in Chicago, in the back of the yards campaign, um, Alinsky's people organized white, um, you know, uh, upper level workers uh, on a campaign that was essentially racist to prevent African Americans from entering the neighborhoods. That's because that's what the people wanted. So, in our tradition, we use the term populism to describe um, this dangerous tendency of basically accepting what the people are telling you. Because after all, the people's thoughts are constructed in a complicated, contradictory way in association with the kind of thoughts of the bourgeoisie and thoughts that we've inherited and so on. The racism, for instance, there's no room for that in our movement. If the people are racist, that doesn't mean you go along with racism to be a populist. So that's what Lenin criticizes in the late 19th century. Well. You know, along comes Mao in the 1940s and 50s, and he develops this idea of the mass line. Um, the slogan that he used was, um, you know, from the people to the people. The idea is interesting. It's not exactly populism. The idea is that you Marxists should not allow themselves, if they are against populism, should not allow themselves to become entirely theoreticist, where you just come up with the theory and you then try to impose it on people, um, because that's the duality between a kind of populism and theoreticism that we find, you know, sometimes um, the disputes take place. He came along and he said, no, there's a dialectical way forward. We go to the people, and, and by the way, this, what Mao is suggesting here is exactly what Gramsci writes about in the prison notebooks, what I think is really the best forms of communist praxis. Um, go amongst the people, find out what the people are, uh, uh, what's happening with the people, try to take the contradictory thinking of the people and elaborate it into philosophy. That's Gramsci's sentence. And then develop that into theory and return to the people with the theory. Um, in other words, the theory must actually have some resonance with people's own thinking. You know, um, and so, you know, when we think about say, um, something like the Black Lives Matter protests, um, you know, the slogan thrown out there was defund the police. It's a pretty aggressive slogan, but even that didn't always have a proper class content. Um, you know, it, it could be interesting to go among the people. If you're from, say, you know, New York City, go among the people. You've got, you've been building and organizing for years. You understand what uh, contradictory thoughts um, the masses have regarding the police or regarding police violence and so on. Um, and then you, you might discover that there are six or seven things that the people actually, um, you know, at their most sophisticated thinking, or if you unravel the contradictions, there are elements uh, of the thinking that you can then 
come back to the people with, you know, for instance, why so much money on the police when there's no money spent on social work? Now, this could be a liberal demand, in fact, uh, but the left should be making that demand. Um, increase the support for social workers. You know, uh, many of the times when people make a 911 call, it shouldn't be for a police officer, it should be for a social worker. Um, increase funding to deal with things like so-called domestic violence. You know, um, who should be coming and, and taking those calls? Somebody, a schizophrenic person is on the street. Do you want a police with a gun there to, to shoot them? No. You know, a lot of the famous Black Lives Matter killings that took place, took place against the uh, marginal sections of the working class, somebody selling loose cigarettes on the street. You know, uh, maybe that's another approach to go is that, you know, let's think about what crime is. You know, why should this be considered a crime? Certainly you're breaking excise laws and so on, but to come back to the people with things that both smell like common sense, but also bring our theory to the masses. That's the mass line is that what begins to smell like common sense, because it does come from popular opinions and so on, also brings our theory into play. Uh, you know, the question of, of for instance, um, you know, uh, this idea that, that we want to build a, a civilization, not where guns always come out as the first answer to every problem, but we have to look at say the care economy. What does the care economy look like? That's part of our theory. Can we bring that theory to bear? Uh, so that's the importance of the Vanguard Party. You know, the Vanguard Party absorbs the wisdom of our cadre who go out there, find out what the masses are, are doing, thinking, uh, where there are opportunities and so on. The Vanguard Party incorporates uh, all that information, uh, elaborates it into philosophy and then, uh, you know, affords our movements the opportunity for leadership. Uh, serious, decisive political leadership. I mean, I think that's the kind of praxis that that's what the concept mass line actually means um, in terms of its, its um, you know, uh, the way we look at it in, in practical terms. Uh, hi, Vijay. My name is uh, Noah. Is she her pronouns? Um, uh, Earlier, you mentioned uh, the concept of voluntarism. I was wondering if you could um, expand on what that means in our movement and how we avoid it. Yeah, great. Um, so this is actually not a concept that is simply from Marxism. This is there even in, in all kinds of other political theories. The idea is that you can have a vision that, look, here we are. We are in a position of, of terrible crisis. 3 billion people in hunger. And somehow we believe we can just end hunger. Let's end hunger. And, you know, people are just going to rise up to end hunger. Who, you know, uh, who is going to be the agent of history here? Uh, the bourgeoisie isn't going to one day say, let's abolish hunger. You know, they will offer that slogan, but they will not bridge the gap between that empty slogan and the practice of actual abolition of hunger. Um, for that, you need a, a project, you need a class project. Why? Because to abolish hunger um, means that you have to confront the fact that there is a, um, a section of the ruling class that owns, you know, food industry and is unwilling to just turn over food to people. Um, that's just not how, the, how it's going to work. So you have to confront them. That's the class struggle. Um, voluntarism is a way to go around the class struggle, to assume that you can just change things just like that, you know, that people just do things and blah, blah, blah. Well, it doesn't work like that, friends. I mean, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, it would be a much easier thing if you can just short circuit history and, and, and do things, you know, boom, like that. No, we have to engage the class struggle. Why? Because society is organized into classes and classes exist uh, because there are certain people who have, um, you know, interests and they would lose a lot if uh, changes take place. Um, you know, go back, don't take my word for it, go back to Frederick Douglass, uh, the great line which you see quoted all over the place, including by liberals, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, it never will. Well, you know, it hasn't and it won't. That's there. The power doesn't concede things without a demand, but it's not just without a demand. I don't think he's, 
Frederick Douglass is saying, well, if you demand it, it will concede it. No, you have to build power against power to, to defeat it. That's the class struggle. So voluntarism assumes there is no need for a class struggle. Hi, VJ. My name is Aiden. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I was, you know, you've said in the past that there are several wars that you believe that the United States could cause at like any day and that, you know, the United States is like an extremely like volatile country in that way. And now we're seeing like the real potential of that um, as we take a more aggressive stance towards China. And, uh, you know, you said at the People's Forum, I remember that I don't care what you think about China, just campaign. That's what I care about. And uh, my question is, you have experience with these past anti-war movements, and what are the lessons that we, the younger generation, need to take from the past? Well, look, I don't think anybody can teach anybody how to build an anti-war movement in the United States, because um, I don't know, they, they just don't seem to... I don't want to sound cynical about it. A million people gathered in New York City in 2003 and were not it, and could not stop the Bush administration from illegally attacking Iraq. And it's an illegal war against Iraq. Um, you know, that's just a fact. There's no UN resolution and so on. Um, did it have an impact? I mean, I, I'm not sure it did. I, I feel a little on the back foot with your question because Right now, the United States is very aggressive on China. And, you know, the Chinese are a pretty confident people. And they have said that they are not going to take this lying down. They're not going to get bullied. They're not going to permit um, the United States to basically, um, you know, um, push back against their interests and so on. Um, they're pretty confident. This is not the China of 1972, 73, you know, uh, Nixon in, in Beijing and so on. This is a different China. Um, you know, just as the Russians don't seem to be uh, cowered by NATO and by the United States, these are very dangerous times for, the, for humanity, you know, and I would put it like that. That's why I said that it doesn't matter what you think about China, you should be against Armageddon. Um, you know, do you want the United States and China to go to war? United States could not defeat Afghanistan. You know, what, what victory will it gain in China? Short of, uh, you know, probably so-called battlefield nukes dropped on Chinese cities and so on. And I don't know how the Chinese will retaliate. This is unthinkable. It's, it's madness, actually, in my opinion. It's utter madness. So you must go amongst your generation of people and campaign against madness. I mean, you know, he, here's the issue. People don't like China, okay. What do you propose to do about it? Go to war against China? That's madness. That's all. You know, if you don't like a country, find some other way than, than Armageddon, you know, to change what's happening in that country. Um, you know, for many years, the US government has tried to find a Gorbachev inside the Chinese Communist, the Communist Party of China and haven't been able to. Um, Xi Jinping is, you know, representative of the left wing of the Chinese Communist Party, which has 95 million people, by the way. He's of the left of the party. Uh, previous premiers were not from that left side of the party. Um, well, there's no Gorbachev available. Um, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to go to war against China. That's insane. Um, that's the basis of a campaign. You know, we started a project called No Cold War. Essentially, the whole thing is this is insane. This is nuts. You know, um, the integration of Eurasia that's been taking place over the last 15 years, Russia, China, Europe, and so on. The U.S. has been trying to prevent this integration. This is a historical integration. You know, for Europe to stop buying energy from Russia is nuts. You know, and that's what the U.S. has been trying to impose on the Europeans. Again, the Germans have said we can't stop buying natural gas from Russia. Why not have a conference, discuss these things soberly, uh, have a meeting about you know, how to engage with the fact of Eurasian integration and so on? No, it's not on the table. Um, the US government, for instance, uh, has banned chip sales to sections of, of, the, of the Chinese. Well, the Chinese have gone ahead and built semiconductor chips. They just, um, you know, uh, 
um, evidence of that is now available, that Chinese firms are going to build their own semiconductor chips. Your sanctions policy is not working against China. You know, you've got to have a way to engage these countries, not try to use war to destroy them. Um, because now things are different. You know, China is not Iraq. China is not Afghanistan. And, you know, in August, Chomsky and I will release a book called The Withdrawal, which is about the U.S. wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, these three. Um, the U.S. interest could not prevail in these three battlefields. How is it going to prevail in China? Are people crazy? They don't understand that China is a major country, 1.4 billion people. Um, I'm not carrying any water for the Chinese. I'm just principally interested in stopping a war. Thank you very much, Vijay. On behalf of the school and on behalf of the YCL and on behalf of our party, we thank you so much for taking time from your afternoon and giving us a framework from which to, or as you put it, uh, a, a, a formal grammar to think about these uh, global uh, issues. Um, and we wish you a safe return back to the States and we'll see you at the People's Forum, I believe in August. Take care, Vijay. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Joe. Bye. Bye.